back and you are in store for a wonderful night with um, Lisa Fine and Charlotte Moss, two amazing authors and designers. Before we get going, let me thank the friends of the Darien Library who make these programs possible. And I'd also like to thank Barrett's Bookstore who have these beautiful books on their shelves and they'd love to see you tomorrow picking up a copy. We'll take questions at the end of the program and you can just type them in the Q&A box. And I have two, I don't know if you can see these, but these are the two books. They weigh a ton, but they are both <laughs> stunning and wonderful gifts. I spent two days cruising them both. And these happen to be the libraries, but I'll be picking up mine tomorrow. Um, so before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about Charlotte. Charlotte Moss has been in the business of design for 35 years. She is known for her timeless style, lay layered interiors, Southern warmth and keen eye. She has received numerous honors, including the New York School of Interior Design Centennial Medal. Charlotte has used her experience from 35 years of decorating homes to design collections of furniture, upholstery, fabric, trims, carpets, sisals, china, photography, fashion, and jewelry. She also has a beautiful Instagram page. Charlotte, excuse me, Charlotte is a prolific author, having published 11 books. Charlotte Moss Flowers is her latest, from, and it is published by Rizzoli. Mississippi-born textile guru, Lisa Fine, is the founder, I'm sorry, is the founder of Lisa Fine Textiles, which specializes in hand-printed linens that are sold in 16 showrooms worldwide. With a Southern drawl, drawl and a truly adventurous spirit, Lisa splits her time between New York and Dallas with frequent trips to India and Paris. Fine's far-reaching travels have continued to influence her collection. Her work, her work can be seen in Elle Decor, House and Garden, Garden UK, House Beautiful, The New York Times, The Tribune, The World of Interiors, and Vogue. She is a contributing editor to Elle Decor and House Beautiful, and she is, I think both ladies are in the South tonight. So let's welcome them and sit back. You're in for a beautiful evening with flowers and travel. My best. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, first of all, I wanna say, I absolutely love Charlotte Moss's book, Flowers. It, it took my breath away, having been lucky enough to be her guest in her house in East Hampton and in the city, always wowed by everything she does. This was a revelation. Charlotte, congratulations. Everyone who entertains, who loves their house should have this book because you not only make it seem easy, which I know it isn't, you walk everyone through every stage and give, and you're so generous with your sources. I can't believe that you did that. I mean, I, I, I love it. And thank you so much for sharing all of your sources. Well, Lisa, you, sh you should be in public relations, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, you know, the, the whole point of the book really is to make flowers accessible. You know, I think, um, and I say this in the book and, you know, we, we do want to talk about things that just aren't in the book tonight because we hope everybody will go buy the book. And so we're going to give you something extra tonight. But um, the whole purpose of writing it was um, it was an accident because I've had all these pictures of all the arrangements that I've taken for years. And, um, you know, I didn't have to go out and photograph a book. It was already photographed. All I had to do then was, you know, all I had to do then was write the thing. And um, so that's what I did last year. But. I wanted to make flowers accessible and easy to people because, you know, people fear arranging. And I've just been doing simple things, you know, poke around the yard, pick some flowers, put them in a vase, you know, pick something up at the grocer on the corner. And, you know, it's just about living with them and, in, and enjoying them. And um, they're also a part of decorating. I mean, to me, that's one of those details that really makes a room come alive. I mean, you and I have talked about this a million times, Lisa, about Nancy Lancaster and, you know, how she, you know, first of all, she was Southern, but she felt that the perfect uh, ambiance 
was candlelight of fire and fresh flowers in a room. Yes, and, ahead. and she didn't say anything about decorating. She just said those three things. So it's not about the decorating. But, but what's so interesting, you not only make it look effortless, you go from like a flower can look really formal and traditional to really breaking the rules. I think you could go out to and weed a garden and come out with a beautiful arrangement. I mean, you really, I mean, it, everything, you cover everything. You cover the one, like when you talk about your grandmother, the memories, how she taught you simplicity and you talk about one flower and then just you cover every single area. And I know that well, you, it's more than just flowers, but it, it, it it's so comforting to know that no matter if you have weeds or one flower, you can do something beautiful. Well, and, well you can. I, now, I don't like weeding very much, but I do think that a lot of weeds are in our future if, when you think about them in a different way, you know. Um, oh, I mean, uh, uh, who is it? Ryan Ganey. Um, may he rest in peace. Great gardener from Atlanta. Um, he had a great definition of weeds. It was like it, it just like it was a flower that um, lost its way or s something like that, you know, and, and I love that, you know. Um, but anyway, the most important thing is to just live with them and and. Um, and enjoy the process. I mean, enjoy the process. Um, you know, I Instagrammed something the other day was a quote by Paul Thoreau, because we both love travel. And, you know, he talked about travel being, you know, um, kind of a nightmare, um, the travel itself. But he said, the great part about travel is the self-discovery. And, you know, I think that's, I think that's so true. Um, you and I both love to travel. I mean, when, you, when we went to India, that was my first time and you had been multiple times and I can't, you know, I can't wait to, to go back again. But you know what I would love to do is, um, I would love for you to talk about your inspiration of India and how it influenced your textile collection and, and whether it's Turkey or wherever it was, to talk about that because I think it's really important that people understand that, you know, you, you, you just don't sit around and wait for the lightning bolt to strike and come up with inspiration that we, we have a way of storing things and storing ideas from wherever we are, whoever we meet, and then they surface in our work. And obviously it surfaced in your whole fabric collection. Well, you know, it's funny because when I first started my collection, I said every single textile is going to be some sort of flower because to me, there's no better teacher than nature and, you know, the colors in nature and the flowers. And luckily, when I went to India, I had never even seen colors that I discovered there. A carnation painted on a, and I took a picture of it and I completed the flower and did it in repeat and it made the really to this day, 12 years later, 13 years later, it's one of my most popular fabrics. And I would say from that very naive drawing of a flower to, you know, taking pictures of a field of, you know, lilacs or, or daisies, you know, you come up with colors and inspirations. And like I said, is, you know, from India to Sweden, I mean, there's just, the, people have been copying botanicals and fields of flowers forever. And to me, there's nothing prettier. Um, I've gone from loving chintz to loving Indian block prints to now, I, I can't decide which one I love more. But um, so- Well, I, I, I wanna see what you do with this new apartment that I know you've purchased. And um, I can't wait to see what you do there. Well, I'm gonna tell you something, Charlotte, because we talk about muses. You are my greatest muse because you love beauty and travel. And it, it, it comes in every part of your life and every inch of your being. But um, a lot of my friends tease me that I've gone too boho and too ethnic. And I actually have. I got into an India frame that I couldn't think of anything that didn't have to do with an exotic country. And um, after being home for the past 14 months, watching old movies, I'm going back to Nancy Lancaster and she, <laughs> and I really want nostalgia and comfort. 
Not that I don't still love what they do, but I think what's going to be interesting is to see how I can fuse them together and um, not have anything that's not, not have anything that's in ethnic per se, but I think I learned a lot about color and flowers and things, but I just want to go back to old fashioned pretty. Nancy Lancaster, fireplace, candlelight, and flowers. Sounds good to me, what you said earlier. Well, do, you th do you think that how you're viewing this now, especially someone whose whole fabric collection is, um, you know, exotic, derived from exotic places, do you think this is what's going to come out of what we've been through in the last 14 months, that somehow that cycle may go back to old fashioned values or something? I hope it not only goes back to old fashioned values, I hope it goes back to lots of comfort food and home cooking. I think that people hopefully are- Oh, I think we've had a little bit too much home cooking. Honey. Yeah, but, but I- <laughs> You know, I'll take a little less of that. <laughs> no, but I just want- <coughs> Yes, but I do think that there's a lot of traditional things and old fashioned things that people are going to learn to appreciate having spent a lot of time at home. And gardening, I have a lot of friends that always like gardening, and now they've been working in their gardens all year. And I think there's, we're going to have a renaissance of flowers and gardens again. And one of the things I loved when you're talking about the muses, I wasn't that familiar with Karen Blixen and Constance Spry. And um, I think you mentioned how they would have cabbages and grapes and all these fruits and vegetables in their garden and their floral arrangements. And hey, I'm for like having it all come back as long as it's pretty. And yeah. hopefully, I mean, tell me a little bit about how you've been inspired by the various muses um, and sort of the eccentricity because your flowers and arrangements, they, they're all, first of all, very few people probably know this. I don't think you ever do anything twice. And you make the comment. Oh, yes, I book. do. You just don't. See. First of all, if you do something twice, you don't write about it, right? <laughs> okay. But, 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 but also, in your book, you say that anything that can hold water can be a vessel. And you it can. Have, you have the most amazing, extensive collection of vases and vessels. And with all of that and your talent to keep things alive, which I've never had that kind of talent with plants. Um, I really want to hear, you know, what, what do you see doing um, with different, you know, from the inspiration you've had from the various muses and coming out of here? I mean, are you going to have a lot of cabbage and grapes and? No, I, I don't, I don't think that you're inspired so much to do something specific, although you might. You know, I mean, I don't think I'm going to put broccoli flowerettes in a silver tea caddy the way Evangeline Bruce did. I think that was very clever and it's a very nice idea. Just, you know, I'd rather eat my broccoli than look at it or something. I don't know. But there, I think what you, um, for me, because I've written the last three or four books have always had women in there as muses because we all look for inspiration wherever we go because one, we know we can find it just about everywhere if we open our eyes. And I find that people are a great resource and they're a great source of inspiration. And there's so many great stories out there to, um, to read. And so if I can write something about some of those women through a filter, in this case, flowers, and bring them to light in a different way, then that's what I like to do when I write. That's, that's, my, that's my challenge when I'm writing, um, is to push myself to do that research and everything. I mean, because, you know, people ask me, you know, what, why in the heck do you do a book on flowers and not another decorating book? And to me, it really was pretty much about decorating in a way. But all of the women in the book, are, are, it's very interesting all incredibly different, incredibly different in their interests, in their backgrounds, and what they chose to pursue. But flowers were a common thread in their lives, and they inspired them all in different ways. And, you know, I love that story about Karen Blixen getting up in her nightgown, going to the garden, picking the flowers, putting them in buckets, and going back to sleep because she knew she had to pick the flowers early in the day. And she loved sharing them with her friends. And, 
you know, I love, um, you know, we don't think about Constance Spry and what she did as being um, ahead of its time right now, because so many great floral designers out there have done extraordinary things. But at the beginning, when she started to go into the woods and put wild and woolly things wrapping around urns and pedestals and coming out, going in all different directions, using material that nobody had ever used, that was a first. She broke ground. Pauline de Rothschild broke ground. Um, I mean, here's That's someone that could do anything she wanted, and she put grass down the middle of the table and flowers wow. coming out of it. You know, I mean, I just love that. So they all inspire in a different way because they all chose to do what they wanted to do. And I think that is the greatest lesson of all when it comes to personal style. Um, I think you have to be willing to just put all those preconceived notions behind you. And I made it very clear in my book, I'm a rule breaker. I know you are too. And every one of those women broke rules and they had their own personal style. And if you're going to be tortured by looking at someone else's playbook, you're going to be tortured your whole life thinking about what other people are going to think. So that's the end of my speech on that, Lisa. So well, well, I couldn't agree with you more because people often ask me how I select the people for my book. And I said, because their houses and interiors reflect more their personalities, their passions, their interests, their hobbies. And it's not about interior de decoration. And they all break rules, even the ones that are in designers. Well, for example, you're, one of the most popular chapters in my book is your house. Um, and, you know, every house breaks rules that I love because there is no right or wrong. If it's beautiful to you and it shows personality, I think it, it's classic and it, it stands the test of time. Which is so, you know, detailed. one of the things that I know that you've done during during this time is you have read more books than any human I know uh, during during COVID. I've never seen a book list like that. It, I mean, it's enviable. And I read a lot, but you read, you're beyond. Um, I know you love Leslie Blanche. Um, I do too. Um, we lo both love reading about exotic places and people like Freya Stark that just is such a beautiful writer. Um, what are you reading now? Right now, uh, believe it or not, I'm finishing the um, Catherine Graham autobiography my personal history. I know it yep. came like 20 years ago, but I just, I don't watch as much news. I've, I've been reading more history and I love that. And next, I don't know what I'm going to read next. I have a great friend who just came out a book called House of Fragile Things by James McCauley about mm -hmm. the Endo family in the collection. And I think I gave you a copy to give to your husband, Barry. Yep. So, um, I've already read it, but I recommend that if anyone's an art lover and loves history. But, um, you know, I've, I've been reading, a, I read a lot of World War II, a um, lot of spy, a lot of spy books. I, I know you love those. Billy Donovan and, you know, all these lady spies. I forget their names. There's so many. I, I, I can't believe how many women were spies during World War II. That, I mean, I think I've read about a dozen. I have the books. I haven't read them all. Oh, my um, Lord. Yeah. And, you know, I always feel like I'm so behind when you talk about what you've been reading. But well, I feel I'm so behind when I look at what you're doing. Um, yeah. Seriously, you are a phenomena. Phenom it's amazing. Um, but back to the inspiration. The one thing I noticed, we both have Lee Radswell in our book. And, right. Um, she's the only one of your muses. I actually ever got to know um, the other ones I've just followed. Um, what inspired you to, to write about her? Because it's funny because she only really liked white flowers or pink flowers. And um, she was- I don't care what kind of flowers you like, you know? I mean, the, the, common, the common thing theme was flowers themselves. I think because Lee had flowers in her life in so many different ways. Yeah. I mean, in addition to the live flowers, you know, she had favorite uh, floral prints. She had those incredible Indian botanicals that were just extraordinary. 
I think she sort of surrounded herself, you know, with all of that. And um, I loved her personal style because she she was quiet uh, about it. And she was, um, I mean, she had a, a restraint. She had a, a, a restraint that um, I envy well, you know, <laughs> because sometimes I don't know when to stop. Yeah, well, she was a great editor. One of my favorite stories about Lee is she had the same um, Demonac, I think, chimps that she had in every single house and apartment she ever had. And when she moved to her apartment in 72nd Street, it, it had been discontinued. And then it was after decades of the same chance she could not use it and i was so excited um when she wanted to see my fabrics and i brought her a big stack because she'd heard how beautiful they were and wonderful well guess what she didn't use my fabric and she didn't use that chintz because she didn't like the way it was printed but she had pink and green stripes because she loved pink and it was so beautiful in her bedroom and she said, you know, her favorite flowers are peonies. She had, she was going to do something pink. And, um, but she was obsessed with flowers. And it was the first time that I think she had a bedroom that wasn't either floral or had botanicals in it. Her bedrooms always had those beautiful botanicals or they were floral. And this time she had just stripes and just fresh flowers in the bedroom. But, um, so Let's go back to your book for a second, because, you know, when I was rereading it and I had not really focused on the fact that there were three, um, three chapters that there were flowers, yes. um, collections and then faraway places. And I guess I just never thought about them being separate because I see so much overlap, you know, <laughs> well, when I finished my book. I thought I was a little embarrassed and I thought, you know, this is a scam. I should just have inspiration because there wasn't a chapter that didn't have flowers because whether it was someone's beautiful garden, like in Delhi or if their fabric, there was flowers everywhere. But I kind of had to break it up because I just didn't, I wanted a focus and I kind of made it up because the three things that are important to me are flowers collections and far away places and even those are there's an overlay with all of them the overlay that's the strongest is flowers because whether it's your garden or your print or, or something I, I just or the colors um so like I said that's what I love but it's so it was a bit of a scam because flowers <laughs> <laughs> but you know I, I name a book flowers because I can't keep even these alive probably past the <laughs> I mean, so, you know, I, 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 there's nothing I love more than gardens and flowers, but I, that's why I have such respect for you because I know nothing about them other than just they're beautiful and they inspire me. I am hopeless of keeping them alive. I even yeah. cut my finger when I cut the stems. But, you know, I think Lisa that, um, first of all, I feel very fortunate that I have a publisher that, is receptive to my ideas about books and how I feel about my subjects. And um, I, I feel that just the way you just described flowers, collections and faraway places as being important to you, don't you feel very lucky that we both have had publishers that let us do that? I mean, I think that's one of the life's greatest luxuries. Listen. I love Vendome and I love my publishers and it was a dream. And, you know, I know so many designers that they're doing books and that they can't sleep and they're miserable and they're so upset. I have to tell you for someone who's not an author, who'd never done a book before, it was the most joyous experience of my life. I loved every minute of it. I well, also because you're a writer, you know, I know so many designers that they want to be able to write, but they either don't have the interest or it's just not their skill set. And so they're a little bit tortured by it because, you know, they have to find somebody to help them write their book. And I, you know, that's really part of my business. I mean, you know, I have my interior design practice, but um, I love writing books. Um, intellectually, it challenges me. It forces me to 
put that pen on paper and start to write. And I was I was speaking with someone today who is thinking about writing a book. And I was describing how it all sort of comes about because I think there's this great mystery that we you sit down at the laptop one day and you say, okay, it's 10 o'clock, we're starting, we're gonna write this book. And um, it doesn't happen that way, at least for me. Um, I've tried so many different things. You just have to find those, uh, those little thoughts, those ideas you get, put them down in your own, you know, in your notebook, however you do it, and then go back and put the flesh on them later. Um, but it, I mean, it's a process, but I, I, I love it. And, you know, and I'm working on the next one. So well, I want to hear all about your next one. No, you're not going to hear about it today. Okay. But, you know, it's funny that you say that because I felt like I was trying to be like, ever I would write about a chapter about you or Lee or something like that, I would just read about you. I'd think about you as much as I could. And I'd take little notes and then I'd get my dog. I'd go to the park for two hours and I would walk with my dog and just think about you. Or think and about think you about what you were about. writing. Or just think about them because I think I'm always so distracted and disrupted in my normal life. And it's almost like you have to get out of yourself, out of your apartment. For me, I did. And just walk and think. And um, it's amazing what you can come up with when you are trying to do 10 things at one time, which yeah. I usually am, you know. Yep. Walking and thinking. But I, but I also... Um, I mean, I, I interviewed Isaac Mizrahi years ago at the Parish Museum, and um, we were talking about inspiration and what gets us fired up and everything. And um, I asked him, "How do you know? How do you how do you do it?" And he said, "He said, look, nobody wants to admit this that that's creative, but we all procrastinate." He said, "Creative people are the greatest procrastinators." He said, "Don't you clean out your closet, Charlotte?" And I went, uh, "Yeah." I clean out my closets. I will do anything. I'll clean out the flower room. I'll organize. I'll organize my desk, which always needs organizing. Because I just can't get started yet. So sometimes I don't believe that for a second. No, no, it's true. It's true. You know, it, it, it just doesn't happen. I remember years ago being at a dinner party. And Barbara Taylor Bradford was there. I mean, talk about prolific, right? And I said, Barbara, you know, this is really sort of an embarrassing question. I know you've been asked a thousand times, but what is your process? Please, please <laughs> give me, you know, what is your process? She goes, well, I get up in the morning and I go have breakfast. And then I go down to the end of the hall to my office and I write until lunch. And then I have lunch and then I go back to my office and I write until five o'clock and I quit. And I went, that's how you do it. She goes, yes, she, a, a machine. There's just the ideas and, and the, the whole story just happens. With, I think with you're some born people. with that. I think you're born with that. I, it's a gift. You were definitely kid. born with that. I could not sit down and start writing a novel. I mean, that's that is definitely a gift. But everybody has a process. Yeah. Um, I, I tried one time going to the office on Saturdays and Sundays, and then what did I do? I cleaned out my desk. I went to the fabric room and started messing around doing some schemes. And then I went and looked at everybody's desk to see who was tidy and who was messy. You know, and I just walked around the office for like four or five hours. I could not work in the office. It took me about three weekends to realize that, wow. you know, and, and a pot of coffee. And, you know, by the time you get home, you're wired and you still haven't written anything. Um, I don't, somehow you get it done because is this like your 12th book? Well, it does get done. It does get done, but it doesn't happen because on demand, you know, it's like ideas, Lisa, when you wrote your book, when you work on your fabric collection, you just, I, I, I can't do ideas on demand. Yeah, no, you're right. But, but you know, the thing is, you don't, because you never stop thinking, though. And you never stop thinking, because I've watched you in awe. I mean, you forgot, I went to India with you, so I saw you 24-7. You had everyone in that entire country amazed at how much. But you, but you know what, Lisa, Lisa, <laughs> yes. you and I both, okay, 
and I think both of us um, have very little patience with certain foolishness and certain things. I will be the first to admit my some of my um, faults and idiosyncrasies, but we just want to get on with it. We are in halfway around the globe and we're, we're there to see things. And yeah. don't start talking to me about your daughter's debutante party because I'm really not interested. I want to see this bloody temple. You know? And you are tired and you don't do naps. And I'm hot. And I'm, and I'm hot as hell. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I don't want to be bothered that way. But yeah. I just, um, I want to soak it all in. I want to see it all. I don't want to miss a thing. Um, morning till night. You're the same exact way. Well, I think um, that is the commonality with, with us that we, we never get enough stimulation, no matter yeah. what. I mean, I can keep going forever and reading forever because there's so much to see and so much to learn. And um, you just- Is this a, this is a little bit scary for everyone listening here. I mean, I'm sitting here look, looking at you, <laughs> like we're having a conversation, the two of us, which we are. And I'm thinking- Oh my God, these poor people get more information than they than they ever they, thought they, they were really going to get. Okay. But but okay. let me just ask you something. You've done a lot of travel. I've done a lot of travel. I've photographed hundreds of gardens. Um, when you have gone to Sweden and um, I don't care where you've been, France, Italy, um, Turkey, what gardens have inspired you the most? You know. I'll tell you what's inspired me, but I'd rather tell you when I was reading your book, what inspired me is I've never been to Sissinghurst and I've read everything uh. about Vita Sackville West and I've always wanted to go there, but I did have the opportunity to live in France, in Paris, and you described this fabulous dinner party in Paris, which I was lucky enough to attend some of those great, those beautiful parties. It's not a garden, but that inspired, if I had to say what inspired, what garden inspired me, I loved when I went to Houghton just because there was so many different, you froze on me. You yes, froze, yeah. You froze on me. I love that because there were so many different things, but I have not seen as many gardens as you have. I, I have more into interiors and um, monuments and, you know, caves and things. I mean, I sadly haven't been to that many gardens. But, All right. But so I I know someone would, would want to ask you this question. Um, and I know we're going to take questions at some point, but where are you going to jump on a plane and go to as soon as you can? As soon as I can. I'm scheduled in May, so I'm not going to wait that long. And, I, you know, I, I had three, four trips. I had a trip to Poland, a trip to go work at San Patrignano in Italy. Um, I had a trip to Derbyshire, and those are the three trips that I'm waiting to reschedule. Um, and I really want to see the places that I haven't seen. Like I want to go all over Eastern Europe because I don't know when it's going to shut down again. I, I want to do that. But I also, every year, I love to go to the British Isles and I love to see English gardens and English houses. And so that is just the given with me. I know it sounds really boring, but I never. Oh, there is it. nothing I, boring about and, that. And, and I want, and like I said, is I want to go to Sissinghurst, Sissinghurst, and where I really want to go that you've told me about so much in Ireland, that's your favorite place in the world. Oh, to go to Ballyfin. That's a, but, Ballyfin. you know, that, that's just a great place to, to, to stay. I mean, it's just phenomenal. It's, like being in someone's private home. So um, you going, where, where are you going to go? Well, you know, I've already got, oh my God. Um, I'm working on a trip to France, but I missed a trip of Southern England doing gardens and houses uh, last year. So that's really high on my list where for next it? year. And I'm also working on a trip with uh, Indigare to do another uh, garden trip um, like we did when we went to Ditchley, remember? I'm, um, no, I missed that. I, I, oh my God. It was, it was the most fantastic trip because it was our Nancy Lancaster. It was our feast. And we stayed at Ditchley. We went to Hazley. We went to Kelmarsh. Um, you know, it was really phenomenal to sort of really 
try to wrap your head around this whole Nancy Lancaster world. And that was just such a great opportunity. So working with them to do another garden tour for next uh, May. Will you do um, Nancy Lancaster again? No, we won't do that again. We're going to do something totally different. Um, In the British Isles? Well, no, um, probably Italy, probably Italy. Originally, we had a plan to go to France, um, but next year I have to do a commencement address in Virginia. So it conflicted with one of the great garden festivals, which, you know, if anyone can go, I think, um, let's see, uh, Chateau de Corson, the, the, the flower festival that is now at Chanty, um, is actually going to happen, I think, in the fall. It happens twice a year. And we were going to try to do it next May and then do Chaumont, uh, the gardens, uh, the horticultural school at Chaumont at the same time, and then do other gardens. Um, it was going to be really a spectacular trip because Stephen Scaniello was going to go with us and, you know, the Rosarian and we we're gonna do special rose gardens. So it still may happen, um, who knows? But those, are the, I, I wanna go exploring, but you know, it's interesting you say, because I thought, yes, I wanna go back to the places that I've already been to, because I just feel like I need to wrap my arms around them and love them again or something. Yeah. But at the same time, there's this part of me that feels like I need to seize the moment and do something I haven't done before, because we just don't know if we'll be limited again. I feel and, and we both hate too. having our wings clipped. Exactly. I feel the exact way you do. It's like I'm dying to get back to England, but I want to go see these places that I, I've never been. And it, it really yeah. a place I want to go that's supposed to be beautiful as far as lushness is Romania. I mean, it, not the gardens, but just the pastures and the trees and everything. I, everyone that I know that has been there and done these hiking trips say that it's just so beautiful. Just nature, nature things. Yeah, you know, Lisa, that's where you and I may be a little bit different. <laughs> okay. I'm not so much into the hiking because I want to move fast and see more things. Oh no, I'm, and, not uh, gonna hike. I'm gonna get a bus. I'm going to drive through those pastures. I'm not. Oh, I thought hike, you were going to go hiking. No, the hikers <laughs> tell me it's beautiful. No, hikers tell me it's beautiful. No, I'm going to take a bus. And then I think you get a little plane to go see the um, painted white churches that are, have all these beautiful fields of flowers. No, we're going to ride right on by those fields and we, then we'll get out if we want to right. walk around them. But no, I'm not hiking. No way. So if you had to tell everyone here your hands down, must do of travel um, to the extent maybe someone hasn't been there. I mean, I mean, where would you recommend people put at the top of their bucket list, so to speak? Okay, my, my, tra my travel tip would be never overbook and leave time because the best trips I've had, well, actually you and Melissa of Indigari told me a, a trip that I was not that excited about that was the most interesting I've ever done. And that was down the Nile in Egypt. Oh. I absolutely love that trip. And the funny thing is everyone said, oh, just fly into Cairo. You don't need to see it. Okay, we stayed five days in Cairo and I loved it. And, you know, I think the biggest mistake people make when they travel is listening to people that want to da 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 because sometimes it's discover things and we did and I think Egypt was the most surprising trip for me it, it's not my favorite country to go to but it's a trip that I can't tell you how happy I was that did it and you sort of paved the way you and Melissa I I adored it I mean I, it was an, an amazing um an amazing trip um in so many different ways um I mean I, I we could go on talking about all that but um do we, do we want to turn things back over to Kathleen to sort of um, direct questions that have come up? Or Kathleen, have, have there been questions come up while you've been uh, watching? No, we have a, a bunch of questions. We have one, I'll start with an easy one. Someone wants to know who Leslie Blanche is. Oh gosh, Leslie Blanche was, a, was an editor, a great writer, an incredible traveler. 
Um, oh. oh my gosh. Um, the Wilder Shores of Love. Wilder Shores of Love. Yeah, be the, that would be the first one to go to, don't you think? Yes, and, 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 and it's uh, four different women who grew up in Europe that traveled to the Middle East and had these sort of scandalous um, lives. And one of, the fa one of the women was actually a great aunt of Pamela Harriman, Digby, Pamela Digby. Oh, wow. And also the Sabres of Paradise is another great one. Yeah. Yeah, I know one book sort of leads you to the next because it was Jane Digby, who yeah. was the, yeah, who had a great life. That was another great book. Yeah. But, um, and I loved um, Around the World in 80 Dishes. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah, that was a great book. I find it. I just, I don't have Up it there. No, sorry. Um, someone also asked who Bradford Taylor, Barbara Taylor Bradford was, which... <laughs> I think she must be one of the few people who don't know who she is, but I'll let you answer that. Well, she was just an incredibly prolific um, modern novelist yeah. um, who wrote ro a lot of romance. And she just, I mean, she owned, she owned that space. I mean, she owns that space. Danielle Steele owns that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, all you got to do is Google. That's the great thing today. Just press a button and you get all the info exactly. you want. You get all the answers. Um, yeah. They, someone would like to know what you, do you think is the most beautiful garden landscapes here in the U.S.? Hmm. Lisa, do you want you want to take that one? You want me to take that? Is, that is uh, Charlotte. You are the expert on that. I'm not. Oh, you know. Um, I love Middleton Place in uh, South Carolina and Charleston. Um, I love Monticello and Mount Vernon because we had two presidents who were great experimenters with the garden and um, they, were real, they were quite knowledgeable about it. Um, they were students of the landscape. I think they were, they were incredible. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's so many. Um, I love going to Huntington Place on the West Coast. Um, Virginia Robinson Gardens in Los Angeles. The list goes on. Yeah, good suggestions. Here's um, a question for both of you. Um, as designers, what do you like most about helping people find their personal style? You know, I think for me, having done it for so long and working so close with, you know, basically they're a stranger when your clients come to you is to try to find something that sparks their interest, something digging around, asking questions, trying to find out about their interest. Maybe you can guide them in another direction and get them excited. Um, I remember getting one client excited about creamware and you know, she's got more creamware than I, you know, Bardith does now, I think. And um, <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I might know who that person is. Yeah, but yeah, but I just love um, knowing that I got someone excited about something new in their life. I think that's very gratifying. That's fun. And Lisa, did you? You know, it's funny. I spend a lot of time like going out to lunch and shopping with my girlfriends if they're, if they're doing their house and I'll go with them to antique stores and I, and it's just fun sort of it start tapping into their brain and the minute you hit on something that you have a commonality like whether you both love porcelain or you both love rugs or you both love India or both um because people come to me because I have fabrics I often end up you know holding friends hand when they're um working on a project but I, I think it's finding the common interest that, that it's something that they really love that you relate to. And then it kind of just snowballs from there. What do you think, Charlotte? No, I, I, I find that very exciting. Um, finding that, that common ground or new ground. I love new ground, exploring new ground. Um, what well, do you, are we, something I'm, you can do anything and make anything look pretty and very few people can do that. But because I'm a person of color, I find it very challenging when someone comes to me and they say, I don't like color. I don't like prints. I don't like anything. Um, someone wants to know, Lisa, why, how, why did you focus on textiles? Or how did you decide to focus on textiles? Well, I'm gonna say something that I shouldn't admit. People, before I became a textile designer, 
people used to ask me what I was and I said, I'm a professional dilettante because <laughs> I loved anything beautiful and I dabbled at it all. And I basically went to India and said, I want to work on textiles. And it just, it was a passion that I'd made enough mistakes and learned enough in the process of a lot of, you know, trying to working with different printers and weavers and manufacturers that I finally took all my inspiration from around the world and mainly India and started printing in California. And it just worked. And, and, and it was funny. Um, I didn't have a business plan and I really didn't know what I was doing. And I have to say my sort of design school was just making a lot of mistakes in India. And it just happened. Um, but I've always loved fabrics and I've always loved design. So sounds like a good place to start. Yeah. Um, this is good for either of you. Have either of you been doing redecorating over the last 16 months? And if so, what was your favorite? Charlotte, go ahead. I don't think either of us ever stopped decorating. No, you know, really, I've been too busy to even think about redecorating. Um, I think you're always doing maintenance. And, you know, I always sell my husband on that, that it's not really redecorating. I'm just doing a little maintenance deer kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, but I, we did buy a house in Virginia. So I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. Um, yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people have been decorating, but I've been, we've been doing that for other people. So there's no time to do it for yourself. <laughs> Um, someone asked, this is for Charlotte, um, you spoke about your grandmother. Can you elaborate on the influence that she shaped for you? You know, I, I think, you know, our mothers, our grandmothers, and they, they just leave a mark, you know. Um, my grandmother just had a great house. She, it was very welcoming. And I think that was the overarching theme of her life was to make the home welcoming for all of us. And we had, you know, big Sunday um, uh, buffets with the entire family. Uh, I learned something about gardening from her. Um, you know, I love how she dressed. I used to love going to her drawers and look at all those kid gloves and all those colors and all those scarves. And, you know, um, I just loved everything she did. And I sort of aspired to be my grandmother. Yeah. Sounds like a good role model. Mm. Uh, this is a question for Lisa. Are your, are your fabrics mostly for interiors or do you branch out into fashion? They're all for interiors. I had a rendezvous in fashion and I stopped that about seven, eight years ago. Regrettably <laughs> for all of us, but uh, they're all for interiors now. Someone said, one person says they'd love to sit and listen to you all night but they'd love to know what some of your favorite things that you use every day are. That I use every day? That you use every day. I think things that I'm always touching and doing. First of all, I'm always, I've always got a book. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd that way, I think. Um, but, you know, I'm always in my flower room uh, doing something. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how to really answer that question. Um, It'll probably come to you at two in the morning. Yeah, probably will, or in the shower tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, something. <laughs> Lisa, do you have a comment that you use every day? That's yeah, use it every day. Um, my Vitamix. I I'm, use I'm my Vitamix. I'm staring at my elliptical. <laughs> I'm staring at my elliptical, and I wish I used it every day. <laughs> 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 I wish, and I'm looking on the other side. I see a martini shaker, and I wish I used that every day. But I. Really <laughs> I can't become a, a martini at home drinker. I'd only do that when I go out. So <laughs> can I just tell you, I've got a martini shaker here, an elliptical there, and I've refrained from the martini and I should do more of the elliptical, but you know. <laughs> Good answers, I like that. Yeah. Um, we have another question. What botanical print fabrics do you like using for rooms shared with men? And the addition of this is I liked the comment made earlier about fabrics as a way to surround yourself with flowers. Can I answer this question because it's hot on my, was it to me or to Charlotte? It was to Go both. girl. 
Okay. Take it away, Lisa. I am obsessed with 18th century Persian botanicals. And I have tried to reproduce them in fabrics and they never quite came out, even though I went ahead and did it because I was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't admit failure. So I just printed it anyway, even though I wasn't happy with it. And finally, just today, I got a letter from some um, craftsmen in Italy that they received my book that I actually had lost for two years, but I just found it in a move. <laughs> so um, I really want to do a hand painted wallpaper. Oh, fantastic. I, I, herbs, the lemon trees. Um, and I don't know if it'll ever happen because I've carried this book around for about 10 years and it's kind of falling apart, but luckily I lost it for five. So um, now I'm ready. So are you going to do that? that answer the question? Are you going to do it with San Petriano? I, yes. Fingers crossed. That's what I'm working on. And I, I actually have too many projects going on at the moment, but he, he, I just got the email today that they received the book and I just found the book when I was in New York packing up my apartment, having thought it was I, meant to be Lisa. It was meant to be. So anyway, but I love um, those botanicals. Sounds good. Um, I guess either of you could take this. What flowers would you choose for a new gardener? I guess there's if you're starting a garden. Everyone, I think, has a list of their favorites, uh, things that they're drawn to. Um, some may be viewed as being difficult. I think people think roses are difficult. Yes, they are work, but they are so gratifying and worth it. Um, I think you just need to uh, do your homework first. I mean, I always tell everyone before they start a project to just do some homework. You know, there are enough gardening catalogs out there and books to look at, understand where you live and what will thrive. And also how much time you're willing to invest in gardening because it's, you know, it's backbreaking work um, unless you're having someone do it all for you. Um, but it's still a lot of work to do the planning and, um, and everything else. Um, I just think you have to do your homework and decide how to start um, realistically. And then you sort of grow into it, just like anything. Um, because it's, you know, it's a commitment. It's a real commitment. Um, it's living you, things. This might tail into that. Um, someone's asking if you could have only three kinds of flowers in the garden, what would they be? Besides roses, roses, roses? <laughs> 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 roses roses and roses That's well i just I, I love fragrance too so there's so many roses that are that are so fragrant um yeah i think i would just do a lot of different varieties of roses and 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 learn more i mean that's what i'm trying now with the roses that Stephen has has found for me and helped cultivate and i'm just studying my own roses Sounds good. One of the uh, members of the audience would like to know more about the tapestry behind you. Oh, I found it in Paris years ago, and it was in my dining room uh, in New York. First, I, I bought it for our house in Aspen. Then, then we moved it to New York to the dining room. And then I found one I liked better from Julia Boston in London. So that ended up in New York, and this one ended up here. But what I loved about it was the landscape and the animals and the exotic fruit. It's very unusual to find animals and with exotic fruit, like the pineapple and the parrot and everything in the background. I, I love art that tells a story, especially something that was woven. So pretty. And woven. Um, I think this, this is for Lisa, and I'm not sure whether it applies or not. Did the pandemic greatly affect your supply chain? You know, the first month I was hysterical. I thought it was the end of my business. I mean, I, and I could list a million things that went wrong. And after about six weeks, everything opened up. It was fine. I warehouse and ship from California. And I feel like not only was it, it fine, and even though the showrooms were closed, people were bored at home and business was fine. But it was a scary six weeks. Yeah. But other than that, I think everything was good. 
Well, that's good to hear. I think we've reached the end of our hour together. I know we could go on all night. You, you two are both charming and I love your trip itineraries. I think we're all completely envious, but thank you so much for coming and joining the Darien Library. And I hope um, lots of people stop by Barrett's bookstore and pick up both books tomorrow. And thank you again for spending your time with us. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, so thank you for the chance to chat with Lisa. It was great. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> all right, good night, okay. everyone. Bye-bye. Good, good night. Thank you. Bye-bye, thanks. Good night. Bye -bye. thanks.